Hello and good evening everyone. I am Karthik, your host for this session along with Pradeepti, organized by Infinito IIT Patna. So it's actually the time to call in your friends to join in one of the most anticipated guest lectures of this week. Infinito IIT Patna cordially welcomes you all to the fourth session of its guest lecture series. Today's session is packed with several inspiring and jaw-dropping stories. Like believe me, it will be overwhelming. You will be pleased to meet a legend who has had a lot of experience in teaching chess and in molding some of the finest minds in this field. So, moving on to revealing the name of today's guest. It is the Grand Master R.B. Ramesh, winner of the 2002 British Championship and the 2007 Commonwealth Championship. Moreover, he is the coach at the Chess Gurukul. He founded Chess Gurukul in Chennai in 2008. Since its inception, Chess Gurukul has been producing world-class chess champions. He has trained more than 10 grandmasters and produced multiple global champions in different age categories, including Pragnanda, the youngest international grandmaster. We all know Sir for his outstanding commentary in the FIDE World Chess Championship match 2013. So, without further ado, we must welcome our guest lecturer, Mr. R.B. Ramesh, here on the stage. The topic of today's lecture is giving checkmates to barriers. So, we would love to hear about your journey and the experiences that you have had. Handing over the mic to you, sir. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And hello, everyone. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to be here among you for this wonderful evening. Uh, so, <clears throat> today I'm not going to... Uh, Initial, at least for the first half of the session, we will not be getting into the technicalities of the game. And uh, upon request, like I'll be analyzing one small game very briefly towards the end of the session. Now, as you all know, like uh, chess is supposed to have originated in India. It was called as uh, Chaturangam. And then uh, it moved uh, from India to Persia, which is the current Iran, you could say. And subsequently, from there to Europe. And uh, from Europe, the chess moved to Russia, the former Soviet Union, and that is where the game actually flourished. And uh, most of the important technical developments happened when the game was flourishing in Russia. And uh, subsequently, uh, in 1988, uh, Vishwanathan Anand from India became uh, our first grandmaster. And that is when chess came back to India, you could say. And it start, kind of uh, started a revolution many young players, including me, we started uh, taking the game seriously after uh, Anand achieved this wonderful feat. And back then, chess was uh, uh, not very popular in India, and it was uh, a struggle to find competitions to participate and improve our games. And there was a lack of everything, you could say. For example, uh, there was uh, not... Uh, Available. It was not possible to get good books by good authors in India because there was no publishing house or even shops were not selling chess books and computer has not yet uh, entered the scene and there were no trainers to learn the game from, there were not enough competitions to play and so on. So there was a lack of everything back then and from then the game evolved with government support, with uh, media support. And also, as a result of uh, success by our young players, the game slowly flourished. And uh, today, we have reached a point where India is uh, among the top five chess-playing nations, uh, strongest chess-playing nations in the world. And uh, we are uh, slowly moving towards becoming the strongest chess-playing nation, which I believe uh, is inevitable in the next uh, decade or so. And chess is generally considered to be a mental gymnasium. It helps in exercising and improving various mental skills like memory, uh, creativity, the planning ability, the decision-making skills. And we can also learn deliberate concentration, like force ourselves to concentrate on the current activity, better time management. It improves uh, our analytical ability, pattern recognition, our intuition, and uh, above all, I would say the sporting skills how you handle victories and defeats, and handling competition, and different types of uh, tough situations. And uh, it, the association with chess can also 
in the long run give us a balanced outlook towards uh, life in general and earlier what used to happen is like whenever an indian player uh, wanted to get better at the game we had to employ the services of uh, foreign trainers and i remember in uh, 2006 uh, when i was uh, about to take a decision to retire from the game as an active player and become a full time coach i had an opportunity to interact with an israeli uh, player he was in the world top 10 and i was just he was my good friend so i told him like i want to quit my playing career and become a full time trainer and he said uh, ramesh one advice i can give you is not to teach everything you know to your students uh, instead uh, try to teach them in small doses like don't teach them everything because uh, soon you will be out of work so to keep the students with you in the long run try to teach them in slow dosages and uh, it was really uh, Uh, initially i was very shocked when i heard this kind of an approach to towards learning and teaching then uh, i understood like i have to have my own uh, philosophy with regard to teaching and learning and so i decided uh, i have to try to teach as much uh, as i know and in quick uh, span of time so that that will more pressure on me to keep upgrading myself and uh, that's the approach i took and uh, uh, these days so from uh, a situation where we had uh, a problem which was uh, unique to those times which was lack of everything as i mentioned uh, earlier but now the problem is exactly the opposite we have uh, access to too much of everything too much information and as a result too much opportunity too much competition and as a result the stress is also increased phenomenally and in my experience working with young players i can see like even children as young as 8 or 9 years old they are under under tremendous stress to perform uh, and also to meet the others expectations so this is the downside of uh, having too much exposure and access to information because all the time the uh, players are feeling they are being judged on a game to game or daily basis this puts a tremendous pressure and as a result uh, the casualties are uh, the creativity the risk taking ability and sometimes the players can be, uh, try to become really safe in their approach and uh, it might be surprising for some of you to know that a chess player can actually burn up to 132 calories per hour and uh, yeah, typically a chess game can go up to 6 hours and uh, a professional he usually practices like 4 hours up to 4 hours or 5 hours before the game so that will be around 10 hours of uh, intense uh, chess concentration and it is possible that a player can even burn up to 6000 calories a day which is more than 3 times a normal person would burn in a day and this is uh, likely due to the physiological effects of uh, stress added stress too much thinking elevated breathing rates elevated blood pressure and so on so just uh, even though it looks like uh, not much action is happening but there is lot of uh, action happening behind the scenes i would say over to you host so i believe you have some uh, questions for me so maybe we can uh, take it from there yes sir that was an exceptional speech sir you have left us a lot of wisdom to gain from the words you said i am pretty sure our audience feels the same so we would like to know more about your journey in the field of chess hence we would have to hear your answers on the questions we have crafted for you So, starting with the first question, sir, what inspired you to take up chess? Like, what was the story behind the first time you held the chess pieces in your hands? Yeah. So, uh, when I was very young, uh, like all other Indian children, I was uh, crazy about cricket, and I was uh, going for cricket training at uh, the YMCA Chennai. And I used to wake up at five in the morning and go for training. The training will start at six in the morning. so we had to go and do some warm up exercise and so on 
and uh, one fine day i got uh, a head injury someone hit the ball and it just landed on my head and that day i decided that this is too risky for me and i was looking for a safe alternative and that's when uh, luckily for me vishwanathan anand became a grandmaster in 1988 late 1988 early 1989 and i thought this is a much safer alternative and uh, came to chess so it was quite accidental i should say literally and uh, subsequently uh, i started uh, and i was uh, 12 years at the time and uh, usually chess players start at much earlier stage uh, for example anand started the game at the age of 6 and i'm starting at the age of 12 so it was a uh, slight handicap you could say uh, but uh, when i started playing in uh, competitions uh, in chennai initially uh, it i was quite successful Uh, i was very quick in my thinking and that was to working to my advantage and subsequently i started uh, traveling to other competitions happening within tamil nadu and eventually it uh, happened like i was traveling uh, all over india and at one point a uh, few years ago uh, me and my wife we were calculating amount of travel i have done and uh, we were surprised to see like i have spent more than a year inside a train traveling to different competitions <laughs> around the country so it has been a wonderful journey and uh, really happy for the decision i took when i was a young kid taking to chess thank you for revealing the most interesting highlights in your journey sir so moving on to the next question well pursuing chess as a career what were the obstacles that you had to overcome yeah um so as i mentioned earlier uh, there was a lack of everything there was uh, lack of training opportunities so you could you did not have chess coaches in india so whom you can uh, go and uh, look up for advices and learn the games intricacies and there were not enough competitions happening there was practically no money in the game and basically no other incentives than uh, to play for uh, your passion and uh, uh, i was not really playing just to make a career out of it i was just playing the game because i loved to play the game and then subsequently as i mentioned i started uh, traveling to different parts of uh, our country and uh, the more i started competing the game also started uh, developing becoming more popular in india there were more tournaments happening and uh, i also came into the indian team uh, and then uh, so earlier the problems i faced was probably lack of everything like we did not have computers we did not have access to internet and i remember when i was in school when internet first came to india so to get an internet connection i had to get a letter from uh, my school and then go to the uh, uh, bsnl office in chennai stand in a queue for many hours and uh, they'll send us back and ask us to come again the next day <laughs> so this happened for a few days and then uh, finally we submit the form and i had to wait around 6 to 10 months to get uh, internet basic internet connection and uh, that was uh, also like without photos or videos only the text will be appearing so just to get an internet connection it was not easy back then and uh, also traveling to uh, other countries in europe it was always a very big a challenge because indians will not get visa easily it will take uh, uh, many days so we have to spend many days in uh, outside the embassy just to get visa and get approval from government and so on and many times when our flight is at 3 o'clock in the morning let's say around 12 o'clock we'll get the tickets in our hand so till then we were not sure whether we'll be traveling or not and uh, so it was really tough to travel to europe to compete in competitions and that's one of the reason vishwanathan anand had uh, settled in europe uh, near madrid for uh, most part of his active playing career and only recently he had uh, come back to india and uh, settled so um, there was a lack of everything back then uh, but it was uh, our passion for the game that kept us going and uh, Uh, there are many times when we have to stay in a school and uh, use the basic facilities and uh, we used to sleep in a bench in schools in government schools and so on but uh, i don't uh, see them as a problem it was uh, the way it was uh, no complaints but it also helped us become uh, more tough instead of looking at things uh, difficult situations as uh, problems i learned to look at them as challenges 
which can be turned into opportunities if we handle it right. That was really intuitive, sir. The way you twist things into being easy is amazing. Thank you. So talking about matches and opponents, which was the most memorable match that you have had and who was it against? Okay, so I have had a very long career as a player. As I mentioned, I started playing chess at the age of 12. And uh, subsequently, at the age of 19, uh, I became an international master. So I had to travel to Bangladesh uh, in 96. And uh, I had to play in a close tournament where uh, there were many international masters participating already. And I have to win the tournament to become an international master myself. And it so happened like in the last three games, I have to win all my three matches to win the tournament and also get my title. And all the three of my opponents were international masters, whereas I was not. I was an aspiring international master. So uh, it was really a tense situation and I managed to win all the three games. Uh, but the most memorable, memorable game, I would say one of it is in the British Championship in 2002, where uh, back then, uh, like Indian players, not just Indian players, any player belonging to the Commonwealth nations, that is the colonies of uh, then British Empire. So there were, I believe, around 52 countries or so. All these countries could participate in the British Championship. Uh, but in any typical national championship, like the Indian national championship, only the Indian nationals can participate. Foreigners cannot play. But uh, this was the scenario in the British championship where the Commonwealth nations can also participate. So I was in the Indian team back then. And uh, I, also, I got a chance to participate in the British championship. And in the last round, I was playing with the top seed of the tournament, uh, who was uh, Luke McShane from uh, uh, UK. And he was the top seed and uh, the tournament favorite. And I was playing with the black pieces against him. And in chess, playing with the white pieces is considered to be a small advantage. And the local audience, you can understand, they were all rooting for uh, McShane to defeat me. But I was really motivated to give my best. And I was hoping for a win because if I win the game, I'll become the British champion. So both of us were under pressure. And the game was shown in a big demonstrations uh, board. Uh, and there was a commentary and all and uh, I played a very nice game and I won the game and when I won the game uh, to my shock like not a single British player or the audience came to congratulate me they were all uh, really angry <laughs> that I had defeated their best player and became the British champion none of them were happy and they, they did not even uh, congratulate but in a way it was like I felt very satisfied with the victory because uh, that's the kind of impact uh, I could our victory can uh, could have and uh, from the following year, they stopped uh, participation of all uh, Indian players from playing in the British Championship. And they said, like, only British people can uh, play in the British Championship. So it was a really very memorable victory for me. And there have been uh, other uh, games as well. But uh, this stands out by a long margin. That was truly interesting, sir. Like, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's always seen that when practicing a sport or an art or any activity with extreme dedication, the perspective on life changes. So my question to you, sir, is that how has life changed after you became a grandmaster? Well, as you mentioned, uh, like uh, when we take up any activity seriously and uh, devote uh, most of your uh, life for that activity, it can really have a deep impact on uh, how you evol evolve as an individual. And uh, for me, uh, my association with chess it uh, changed me completely i would say when i was a young boy i was very impulsive and uh, aggressive uh, very temperamental uh, you could say very impulsive and i did not have patience i was uh, always reacting to things impulsively and emotionally and uh, also um, i was not taking most of the aspects of life very seriously it was everything i was very outgoing person and uh, i did not have the maturity to handle things in proper perspective you should say but uh, as i started playing the game more seriously started traveling to different parts of uh, our country and when i started looking at uh, how our country was uh, the different aspects of life 
then it had a very big impact on me initially i used to feel uh, like for example when uh, i started playing in international competition the first international competition i played was at uh, kolkata and it was the gudrik international open where for the first time in my life i was i had a chance to uh, look in person foreign grandmasters and uh, for the first time i should say i could say i am meeting a foreigner and i used to feel very inferior because i am an indian i am not i felt i am not good enough like them uh, so uh, i am supposed to lose to them without a fight and uh, that's how most of uh, players of my generation used to look at things and uh, when we when i started traveling to europe and us to compete in competitions i used to think how beautiful these countries are and uh, our india is not so beautiful not so clean and so i used to feel very bad about all this and kind of inferior but uh, when i started uh, interacting with the people i could uh, realize like um, we are uh, in no way inferior as uh, human beings and we have a lot of value systems and we have lot to offer to the world and uh, i wanted to uh, make india proud in at least one aspect which is uh, within my reach that is in chess so i try to uh, uh, bring the name of our country on the top as a player and subsequently when i realized like as a coach i'm uh, even more effective because when i started uh, working with uh, young chess players uh, back in 1998 um, so my first student was uh, arthi ramaswamy uh, i started working with her in 1998 and in the very next year she became world under 18 champion and this was the first uh, world youth title india had and it was in one of the strongest categories that we won the gold medal so and i intuitively understood that as a coach i can produce more medals for our country and uh, then i uh, started working with uh, many players from different generations and when i made this transformation from uh, being a player to a coach i understood that uh, um, i have to look at things from a completely different perspective when you are a player you are mostly thinking about your progress your uh, interests but uh, when you become a coach you have to forget about yourself and your students interests their progress becomes your priority and this uh, change in sh uh, shifting of priorities was not easy initially and i was always trying to look at uh, students from how my mind works and then i understood like every individual has their own way of looking at things their own perspective and i have to learn to look from my students perspective to understand their problems better so that i can uh, provide effective solution to their problems and uh, so this way i learned to look at things from others perspective and i also learned that i have to be more patient with others because whatever is very obvious and simple to me it is not the case uh, from uh, the students perspective they are looking at things from a completely different level and i have to understand their viewpoint and uh, be effective so i learned how to be patient i learned uh, to control my emotions i learned to be more calm with myself and uh, i also learned to be more hard working initially i was relying mostly on my talent to get achieve things i wanted in life and i thought just with my talent talent i can uh, achieve whatever i need but then subsequently i understood the value of working hard i understood that there are uh, my likes and personal likes and dislikes they have an impact on uh, what things i learn for example in cricket terms if you see like uh, there are players like rahul dravid who is very solid uh, you can say quite a slow player but very steady he doesn't get out so easily but there are players like uh, let's say virender sehwag Uh, who are like very aggressive in their approach and uh, in a team game you can have one person to play aggressively one person one player to play solidly but in a chess game it's a very individualistic sport and uh, an individual has to be good at whatever the demands and the position are we should be able to deliver so i also learned that i not only have to learn things which i like uh, i also have to learn things which i don't like and this was very difficult because my 
instinct instinct and nature says i don't have to do these things because i don't like them i am not good at them but uh, as a player to be successful i have to learn and master those aspects as well so chess has had a very big influence on my life and whatever i am today as an individual um, it's all because of uh, chess and the way whatever things i have learned from the game that was quite intuitive sir even i like practicing table tennis and it has been slowly changing the way i see life sir we are curious as to what your first impressions were of pragnanda after you met him yeah so pragnanda like uh, when i started working with him uh, he was around 7 uh, and 1/2 years old i think if i'm not mistaken and currently he is like uh, 16 years old so around 8 years i have been working with him as a coach and uh, before that i have uh, had a huge experience of working with many talented players who became grandmasters national champions and international medal winners so i have uh, already had a lot of experience working as a trainer with many of the talented young children from india and uh, uh, but uh, the thing special with pragnananda there are a few qualities i should say one uh, he was uh, already very clear even at a young age tender age of less than 8 years he was already clear in his mind that chess is going to be his life or it is going to be his life for uh, most part of his uh, life and uh, he also knew intuitively that he is destined for some great things and this usually is not the case with many children uh, many children they like to play chess and they are passionate about it for whatever reasons and then uh, they don't understand that they don't realize that to be successful in chess or for that matter in any activity one needs to work really hard and learn to look at things from a long term perspective but most children they are uh, interested in getting success in a very short span of time so they don't want to like wait for good results to happen uh, but in prak's case he understood that to be successful in the short run is easier and for he was extremely talented he knew he was talented and uh, he was already like national under 8 champion when i started working with him so he knew like success at the lower level is quite easy but to be successful in the long run at the higher level it takes more than just talent and passion for the game and uh, he was extremely hard working so when we started working together i tried to explain my philosophy of chess how i look at things and one of the things i tried to emphasize him is he should always play chess not with any particular aim in mind for example i need to win today at any cost or i need to win this competition and so on instead uh, try to focus on giving his best effort uh, in every game he plays in every com- competition he plays so giving his best effort should be his priority and he should also enjoy uh, chess despite uh, whatever happens to the game like sometimes he'll be winning sometimes he'll be drawing sometimes he'll be losing and all this can have a big impact on uh, a player for example these days what is uh, very common like when a young player loses a game they not only lose game and become sad they also lose a part of their confidence or the self belief they have in themselves they start thinking like with every loss that they are not destined to be a great player they are not destined to uh, achieve great things in chess and they start Uh, doubting their capabilities just because they lost one or two games but in prag's case uh, we try to make it clear that there will be sh- shortcomings uh, there will be setbacks in the short run but that should not affect our confidence and the self belief he should know that he is a strong player and the temporary setbacks are very going to be a common phenomenon throughout the career so whatever stage we grow there will always be setbacks and we should uh, learn to handle them maturely and uh, he understood it very at a very young age so for prag when he loses games it doesn't affect him very personally for uh, longer time sp- 
stands like unlike others and he was extremely hard working and he practices uh, probably from 6 to 8 hours every single day and uh, he is also very malleable uh, to learning things which he does not like like i mentioned earlier so there are some things which he does not come to him easily but he is fine with working hard and learning things so we both believe like if you put our heart and mind into anything we can uh, master it uh, provided we put sufficient time and effort into that activity and uh, also we decided that we will force him to come out of his comfort zone as often as possible as frequently as possible because human nature is to settle down and uh, try to repeat things which are working for us and uh, we will tend to become comfortable in repeating repeatedly doing the same thing uh, but to learn and master different aspects of the game he has to keep trying and experimenting new things new way of looking at things so we decided we will constantly be experimenting even if it is going to go against us uh, once in a while so i think uh, these are some of his main qualities i would say and also his memory is phenomenal and whatever games we see in our classes he kind of has a photographic memory he can remember it for years together and that is also working to his advantage sir it's amazing to know a prodigy like this like the way you're explaining all his qualities and it's beautiful that he puts in his 100 percent efforts into each thing he does on an everyday basis i guess we all do need that kind of a quality uh, so talking about fee day could you provide us some tips for boosting fee day ratings well uh, like in every sport uh, we have uh, some mechanism by which we can uh, judge a player's progress so the world chess federation we call it as fide it is based in uh, switzerland and uh, they have uh, their own rating system which are called the fide elo rating system and basically how it works is like when there are competitions happening around the world and some of them are uh, fide rated what it means is like the organizers tournament organizers they have registered through their national federation to the world chess federation fide and uh, if you inform them in advance and pay the necessary fees, the tournament is considered to be federated. And in such a federated tournament, there'll be uh, players who already have a federating, and there'll be some players who don't have a federating. So when we when the players don't have a federating, they have to play against a specified number of federated players. And if you have meet the requirement, uh, the criteria, then uh, they get their ratings. And the, typically, the FIDE rating starts uh, from 1,000. That is the base rating. And uh, the current world champion, Magnus Carlsen from Norway, he has a rating around 2850. And his peak was uh, 2876. And this is the highest uh, human being have has ever achieved. And uh, to boost rating, one, we have to compete in FIDE rated tournaments that are happening around the country. And uh, you have to, which entails uh, you have to travel to other parts of India to compete in such federated tournaments. And typically, a federated tournament happens for around between seven to nine days, and we'll be playing usually one game per day. So, um, if you play sufficient federated tournaments and uh, meet federated players, typically the rating goes up if we show good results against them. Now, the other related question could be like. To get boost our FIDE rating, it is uh, necessary that we improve our chest strength, the playing strength. From where we are currently, we should uh, keep making progress. And if our uh, chest playing strength is improving, it will be reflected in our improved uh, ratings as well, which entails a lot of hard work. And if you want to go into the specifics, then uh, it is important to we have a build a good opening repertoire. Chess typically is divided into three phases, the opening phase, the middle game phase, and the end game phase. And in the opening phase, we need to build a good opening repertoire. That means there are many openings possible in chess. We have to choose and learn openings which are close to our personal styles. So if I'm an aggressive player, I should choose aggressive openings and so on. And uh, the other aspect is uh, the middle game. 
basically one needs to have good calculation skills you need to have the ability to visualize what is going to happen in the future based on the current course of the game so you have to accurately calculate how things can evolve and uh, make your moves accordingly and in end game it happens once in a while that the game goes to end games you need to have a good end game technique where the advantages we have acquired in the middle game are converted into a win in this phase of the game so in all three aspects of the game we need to work individually at home uh, these days it's very good if you can uh, learn from a coach who has a lot of experience and there are many platforms which provide a training there are many apps many databases uh, from where we can learn some of the websites i can uh, recommend for learning the game is www.chess.com or uh, leeches uh, leeches.com or chesstempo.com chess24.com so there are many good websites from where you can learn different aspects of the game to boost your fidelity ratings so that was really very insightful thank you sir apparently your spou spouse also happens to be a grandmaster sir so sir we are eager to know if chess played an important role in the meeting of both of you yeah so my wife's name is uh, arti ramaswami and uh, she is a women grandmaster and uh, so how i met her like uh, she was also a uh, she is also a chess player uh, that's how we came to meet the first time was uh, when i was around 16 years old probably i was playing in a tournament in maharashtra and uh, i won the tournament so i was feeling really good about myself that i'm becoming a very strong player and immediately upon my arrival back to chennai uh, i had to compete in a local tournament and that's where uh, i played with arti in the first game and uh, i lost to her and i really felt so bad that i lost to your small girl because uh, she was like 10 years old i am like 14 or 15 years old and i lost to her uh, just immediately after winning a strong tournament and i felt very ashamed and i withdrew from the tournament and i told myself the next time i play against her i'm going to win and then the, after a couple of months we played again and uh, this time i won and uh, in 98 i uh, her parents approached me to be her coach and as i mentioned earlier she was my first student and uh, in the very next year she won the world under 18 championship and then uh, in 2003 she became a women grandmaster and also became uh, a national women champion and she has won many age category nationals asian uh, championships and so on she is a very strong player herself and uh, since we started our uh, chess gurukul academy in 2008 at that point i retired from my playing career because i wanted to focus full time as a trainer she has been uh, helping me in uh, administering our academy as an administrator because we get uh, hundreds of emails phone calls on a daily basis and uh, there are many things that need to be taken care behind the scene so that i can focus fully on uh, teaching my students so she has been the backbone of my both my playing career and also my coaching career and she has uh, transformed the chess gurukul into uh, one of the best chess academies in the world we have taught more than 100000 students in the last 13 years and also we have more than 1000 uh, students at any given point of time learning from our coaches uh, they are spread around the world different countries we t- we have students from all continents of uh, the world so she has uh, been uh, uh, really great for me and as a wife she has been taking care of uh, our family and also the academy and uh, all my success uh, full credit goes to her that was a really beautiful fairy tale sir it sounds exactly from a story book as we have reached the end of the session we would, we would like to wind up by asking the last question for the day so how do you see your life to be without chess like a world where a sport team chess wasn't played mm. 
okay so this is really tough because uh, as i mentioned uh, from when i was uh, 12 years old now it's like more than 3 decades i've been associated uh, with chess and uh, when i was a player i was practicing probably 6 to 8 hours a day and uh, after i became a coach it kind of doubled i've been uh, teaching chess probably around uh, on an average 12 hours every single day uh, all my coaching career last 14 years you could say so uh, from the time i wake up i wake up uh, at 5 5 in the morning every day and uh, at 5:30 i start uh, my classes because i have many students in the us that is evening time for them so from the time i wake up chess is already in my thought what i'm going to teach to my students what are their problems and so on until i go to bed i'm constantly working with uh, different players and their problems and uh, whatever i have achieved in my life uh, whatever recognition i have got and uh, whatever personality i have uh, obtained all these years it's thanks to chess so i am really not sure what i would be without chess and what kind of an individual i would have turned myself into and as i mentioned earlier i was very temperamental did not have patience i had many faults as an individual and uh, from chess i learned to correct myself and become a better human being so it's really hard to imagine my life without chess i'm really not sure what i would have become <laughs> thank you sir those are the questions we had for you and you beautifully answered all of them thank you before ending this fun filled evening so we would want you to do a game analysis along with three out of top 5 participants of chess tournament held by infinito iit patna sure so can i share my screen yeah hello rajdeep shifty good evening sir hello sir hello hello we will be glad to meet you all so congratulations for uh, coming in the top 3 thank you thank so you much sir. sir so do you all have a chess rating yes uh, sir so not a fide one but we do play on online tournaments like we played on leeches leeches okay that's wonderful yes sir okay so uh, maybe i can uh, share my screen just a moment please Okay, so I am sharing. Um, so the first game I wanted to share with is like uh, Paul Murphy versus uh, Duke in 1858, more than 160 years. And uh, let us quickly go through the game. Uh, if you have any questions, so please uh, stop me and ask. I'll be happy to explain. So it's a very small, short game. And e4, e5, knight of three, d6. This is called the Philidor opening. And uh, normally they put the knight to c6. This is what uh, is usually played. But uh, one moment. <coughs> okay, I'm trying to take back. it's not happening okay so maybe i will share uh, another chess board please hold on okay okay so we are back again So this is the Philidor variation, and White is fighting for control with the move d4. And there is also pressure on uh, the pawn. So Black played Bishop g4, trying to pin the knight against the queen. But the problem with this move, it's already a mistake, and uh, because of this game, players understood that the move Bishop g4 is not good. So Murphy took uh, d5. and morphy was one of the best players of his time and uh, yes he was very aggressive 
and he also understood uh, the needs of uh, modern chess which was to develop pieces very quickly right from the beginning of the game and he was always trying to get on the offensive from the word go so he is playing very forcefully here capturing the central pawn and uh, black captured the knight because the knight was attacking the e5 pawn so he captures with the queen now all you can see the queen is developed and black took and the Murphy played bishop c4 now the pawn on f7 and yeah so the pawn on f7 is under uh, attack by the bishop and the queen so black developed the knight and this move also blocks uh, the queen's attack on f7 so Murphy played queen b3 this actually effectively uh, puts black in big trouble already because the pawn on f7 is under attack not only that there is a double attack on the pawn on b7 as well so the queen is uh, for yeah it's a double attack on both f7 and b7 points so black played queen e7 to defend the pawn on f7 now any normal player would have uh, captured queen into pawn but that would have allowed the black queen to bring the queen to b4 with a check exchanging the queens which is still good for white but murphy uh, played like a typical modern player he declined win of material and gave priority to developing his pieces quickly and this is one of the things we can learn from uh, such classics uh, the strong players they give priority to quick development in the opening over winning material so now white wants to capture the pawn on b7 without allowing the black queen coming to b4 with check so white played black played the c6 which controls the knight's movement to these squares and also the queen is protecting now, white cannot capture the pawn because the queen is protecting the pawn so morphy continues which is uh, with his strategy of quickly developing the piece so with each move you can see one new white piece is entering the game already you can see four of white pieces has been developed whereas only two of black pieces have developed two against four so here white black is the pawn on b5 attacking the bishop or the pawn is attacking the bishop and a normal player would have considered moving the bishop back to either of these squares but Murphy came up with a very brilliant sacrifice here he captured the knight the pawn with the knight basically giving up a knight for a pawn and uh, he captured the pawn as well giving a check to the king so black interposed with the knight and it looks like black king is safe now and white's attack has fizzled out but Murphy continues with the strategy which is already familiar to us with each move he is bringing new units into the attack so by castling he is adding more pressure pressure on this point d7 and this knight is already pinned by the bishop and this other knight is pinned by the bishop the other bishop so both his knights are pinned and his king has got stuck in the center so duke played rook d8 so basically the knight is getting protected by the rook so here morphy sacrificed his rook as well now black cannot uh, capture with the knight because the bishop his queen will be lost the bishop will capture the queen so he took with the rook and the final piece comes into the game the rook on h1 was not developed that has jumped the game. So you can see how effectively Murphy is using all his pieces in action. He's bringing all the pieces into the scene of action quickly, and he doesn't mind sacrificing material in the short run. So he moved out of the queen pin, and he gave a check. They have the rest of the capture, and Murphy finished off. Win the win the fantastic. <laughs> B8 would be so you can see that it has sacrificed six of his pieces hmm. only two pieces remain in the game and he was able to deliver checkmate with very less material on the board so that was a very short game and very instructive as well in many aspects
I hope you enjoy it. Yes, so yes, very, very much. Very, very. That was a very uh, good game to learn. Yeah, so basically, like, uh, Monty was not afraid to take this. This is something we need to learn not only as a player, but also in our life. That to achieve bigger things, we should be ready to compromise or sacrifice to achieve a bigger ends in life. And through chess, not only we learn about this type of things, but also lessons to learn to our life. Yes, sir, sure. Sir, I wanted to ask you one question regarding blindfold. So, how to improve that blindfold game, or what are the benefits of you know implying this blindfold game? Okay, uh, so it's really not easy to play a blindfold game if uh, we not uh, understood the game uh, to a healthy level, and also we need to have uh, been practicing and playing the game for a few years at least to get the physical board in our head because it is very easy to lose track of the game when we are trying to play blindfold because the pieces are moving only in the head not on our physical board and we are not able to yes, see it in our eyes so it requires a lot of practice but uh, my suggestion would be not to worry too much about this aspect of the game so if you love chess, it's more important to have fun playing the game, enjoy the game with all its uh, thrills and success. So uh, once you have played the game for a few years, you will be able to play with yourself as well. Okay, thank you so much, sir. So, best of sir, to I also had one doubt regarding the bishop pair in chess. As uh, we, have, we know that uh, bishop is worth like three points. And so is the knight. But a knight pair is not considered as important as a bishop pair. Why is that so? So the knight is a very uh, short range piece. It cannot move very far. Ah. You know that knight moves in a L pattern, but it moves only three squares at a time. Whereas a bishop is a long range piece. So the bishop can, uh, from one place, it can uh, look at, uh, it can control effectively a long diagonal. Control in a long diagonal. So, so when you have two bishops, you can control many squares across the board. Whereas, as I mentioned, the short knight is a short range piece. It can control only a few squares. That is the reason it's better to have two bishops than two knights. You can control basically. But sir, most uh, yeah, but sir, in a position, uh, let's say uh, a, a closed position is there, uh, so that bishop pair will not be considered much greater than the knight. Yeah, because uh, knight can jump over pieces, and bishop yes. cannot. Yeah, knight has the ability to jump over uh, units, whereas uh, bishop cannot, as you rightly mentioned. And also, knight is a short-range piece, so in closed structures, uh, the knights can be more effective than a bishop. So typically, the side with the bishops, you should try to open up the position. If you're playing yes, with sir. the knights, you need to keep the position closed. That's one of the strategies we need to keep in. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The game analysis was quite informative, sir. Thanks to the three participants who joined in from the chess tournament. So the knowledge that you have bestowed on us shall be used well. And I'm pretty sure the audience feels the same. You beautifully answered all our questions, um, made a short presentation with the game analysis and gave us a lot of insightful and thought provoking things to ponder on. Thank you, sir, for joining us this evening. We are truly fortunate to have such a knowledgeable person amidst us. I further love to extend a gratitude on behalf of Infinito IT Partner for taking out time from a busy, busy schedule and, growing, and for growing our interest in chess. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Raditi and uh, Karthik, for uh, hosting this uh, session. I really had a good time interacting with uh, all of you. And uh, I wish uh, all the best for uh, a bright future for uh, each and every one of you. Thanks for the opportunity again. Goodbye. With this, um, we come to the end of our guest lecture series and hoping to see you all in the comments. Until then, stay tuned and feel the burn. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir.